Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Ellen Peters, Philip H. Knight Chair and Director of the Center for Science Communication Research in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. Professor Peters also directs UO's Cognitive and Effective Influences in Decision-Making Lab, and she is an affiliated faculty member in the Psychology Department and an associate in the Phil and Penny Knight Campus for Accelerating Scientific Impact. Peters is an academic expert in decision-making and the science of science communication. Her primary research interests concern how people judge and decide and how evidence-based communication can boost comprehension and improve decisions in health, financial, and environmental contexts. Professor Peters has received an NIH Group Merit Award for exceptional advances in inter integrative, cognitive, effective, and social processes into cancer control research. And she was the first American to win the Jane Beattie Scientific Recognition Award for Innovative Contributions to Decision Research. Professor Peters is the author and co-author of numerous publications. Her book, A Numeracy in the Wild, Misunderstanding and Misusing Numbers, was published in 2020 by Oxford University Press. Thanks, Ellen, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Ah, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Paul. So tell us first a little bit about your background. Sure. So I am what is called a decision scientist. Um, my PhD is in psychology. I actually got it from the University of Oregon, um, from the psych department here. Uh, a gentleman named Paul Slovic was my advisor. Uh, and I worked a lot with a, um, a great social psychologist named Myron Rothbard as well. Um, my, you know, my field of decision sciences um, is very interdisciplinary, and it's because there are just all kinds of things that affect and influence how we how we form judgments about the world and how we make choices um, when uh, out in the world. Um, and my background is very interdisciplinary too. I have, um, while my PhD, my master's and PhD are in psychology, I have undergraduate degrees in engineering as well as, um, as, well as in marketing. Um, and I once worked as an engineer developing laundry detergents for Procter & Gamble. So you worked, you mentioned you worked for many years with Paul Slovic at Decision Research. Tell us a bit about decision research and the kind of work you did there with Professor Slovic. Yeah, so so uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to use first names because I will never remember to, to say Professor Slovic because I've known Paul for far, far too long. Um, so so Paul and I have worked together for many years. He was first my, as I mentioned, he was first my advisor in graduate school. And then he invited me to join his company, Decision Research, uh, when I graduated. And then I ended up staying there for 12 years. Um, decision research is this really unique and interesting organization. It, it's a not-for-profit research center. Um, it, it's essentially, you can kind of think about it as an academic institution minus the students and run completely on, on what's called soft money, meaning that I got a whole bunch of experience writing grant proposals. Uh, and you know the work, the work that I did there, the work that's done there is it's pretty varied. Um, it's also why I like this field of decision making so much. Um, so, so Paul and I did research on everything ranging from gambles to nuclear power. So, in the field of decision making, you know how there's um, uh, 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 researchers sometimes use fruit flies, or there's a particular fish actually that's used at the University of Oregon. I forget the name. Well, gambles are the fruit fly or the fish of our field. Um, we use uh, we end up using them to understand how people process probabilities and how they process outcomes that might occur, because so many decisions in life end up involving probabilities and end up involving outcomes, and you have to figure out what they are and how to integrate them and ultimately how to choose and this combination of probabilities and outcomes is true in gambles, but it's also true in nuclear power, gun control, COVID-19, prescription drugs, cancer screening, like it, there, it's sort of all over the place. And so with Paul, what I did was a, a lot of basic theory development. So we looked a lot, for example, at how people process emotion, process it, when they're making decisions, how they process information emotionally, and also how they process it in, analytically. Because it turns out that we tend to use two different modes of thinking um, when we judge and decide. And one is more experiential and emotional and the other is more analytic. Uh, we also looked a lot at number processing and math ability um, because it turns out that people, uh, well, first people process numbers in some very funny ways. And then um, 
depending upon how mathematical you are, you'll tend to process information differently. And so you might make a different decision about a vaccine, for example, if you, even given the exact same information, if you're better or worse in math ability, you might make different decisions about a vaccine or about you know, going back to nuclear power again. Um, and there's just all kinds of really interesting ways that, um, that decisions get made and that people differ in how they end up making those decisions. And so Paul and I looked at a lot of those questions. And uh, you know, it, it rate, we, we did studies ranging from different card tasks that people played um, to medical errors. It turns out in medical, uh, you know, medical errors are made in hospitals sometimes. Um, and it turns out that white males are actually a little more vulnerable to having a medical error made on them in a hospital. Um, they perceive less risk from them. And it seems to be because um, they feel less vulnerable. And so maybe they're a little less careful as a result. Um, all kinds of things. Um, sometimes uh, there's not so much individual differences. I always find them fascinating, but sometimes it's not so much individual differences, but it's more about things like just how bad we all are at processing like really big magnitude numbers whether it's amounts of money like for the federal budget or it's numbers of people at risk. So, you know, and then all kinds of applied problems as well from Medicare choices to, um, you know, medical errors and hospitals and nuclear power again. So that all sounds fascinating to me. So what prompted you to leave decision research and go back to the academy at the Ohio State University? Yeah, so um, I love being at decision research. There, I learned all kinds of fun things. Um, I learned how to write grant proposals, which in academia is helpful. Um, I'd been there about 12 years. Uh, our, our kids, my husband and I have three kids. All three of our kids at that point had gone off to college and we were home empty nesters and kind of enjoying it and kind of not, but realizing we wanted to try something new. Um, and just at that moment, the psychology department at Ohio State University happened to contact me and said, look, would you like to look at this job? Um, and so I went to look, I wasn't planning on taking it. And I got there and it was, it was just something new and exciting with different people. And I wanted to talk to them. So, okay, so here we are a good many years later and you have recently returned to Eugene, to Oregon and to the University of Oregon. So what, what brought you back? Yeah, so all kinds of things. First of all, Oregon's the best. It's just, a, it's a nice place to live and Eugene is a really nice place to live. And we always had it in the back of our heads that we might move back at some point. Um, but also a, a great opportunity came up here. Um, in the School of Journalism and Communication, they advertised a position um, where I could be the first permanent director of a new center for science communication research. And I liked the idea of building up a new center and building up a new center that I thought we could make a real impact on the world. And so, and so, so that that's the most that those are the, kind of the, the two most important reasons. But there's also some great researchers here. There's some great practitioners in terms of communication. Um, I have to say, COVID has slowed me down a bit. Uh, I'm looking forward to that sort of passing by the wayside, so that we can, so that I can basically get outside more and chat with people more around Oregon. Because I have spent six months not in the pandemic, and then two and a half months now on Zoom. <laughs> So um, tell us about the work of the Center for Science Communication Research. What do you do there and why is what you do important? So the, the mission of, this, of our center, um, so we call it SCR. Uh, it's the Center for Science Communication Research. And I will accidentally fall into SCR. Um, so I'll just go ahead and tell you what it stands for now. But our, our mission is to make complex science useful and useful in a particular way, useful so that people can make better decisions and they can lead better lives. That's the sort of, you know, sort of big picture overall idea of what it is that we wanna do. And so what we do as a center is some of us do research. And so I do research across a variety of different issues, um, looking at both developing basic theory and looking at applied problems where I can make a difference. Um, uh, we also teach science communication. We have a science communication minor and we also have public engagement. And then sort of the overall idea of the, of the center beyond those sort of three thrusts is that we're looking to build community. We're looking to build community around science communication, around science communication and to kind of drag more people into our, uh, into our playpen. <laughs> so um, you, you get this job directing this new center for science communication research and then COVID hits. 
if there ever was an event in my life that convinced me of the importance of science communication, it is the COVID pandemic. So tell us about the way that the COVID pandemic has impacted the work that gets done in, in SCR. Yeah, so I'd say there are, well, there's a few different ways it has. Um, one of the first things that we did, um, so, I'm, so here I am, a new person at the University of Oregon. I knew people before, fortunately, but now I'm stuck at home and I don't know that many people. And I'm kind of watching the communications and I'm a, I'm a decision-making person, but I'm also a communication person. And I was watching the, um, the communications come out from the university um, and, and I could see where they were coming from, but I, I could also see where it could be done better. And I could see that there were some opportunities where the researchers at U of O could actually help out the university and hopefully make our university, but also our community a better place through communication. And so one of the first ways that the, that the pandemic ended up, in, um, ended up having an effect on what we do is uh, I was able to, um, I contacted some fantastic people around the university and different departments around the university and brought them together into what was essentially a consulting group. And so there were probably maybe 10 or 12 of us from departments around the university. And we got together um, after talking with the, the president and the provost and the, and the, um, the vice president of, of communication um, and came up with a high level strategy document for the, for the university so that people would know kind of here are the key ways that you want to communicate about COVID-19. We, we didn't do the messaging for them. That's not what we do, but we know from a, you know, we knew across all of us from a research standpoint, these are the kind of things you want to talk about. And this is the kind of way you want to talk about them. And then we did an hourly consulting meeting for people if they wanted to come in and talk about specific issues around COVID. And we did that for maybe a year. We did that for quite a while. So that was one way. Um, let's see, another way, uh, my student, I have a fantastic graduate student in psychology named Michael Silverstein. And he walked into my office at one point. This is, you know, supposedly pre-pandemic. And he said, you know, Ellen, there's this weird thing happening in China. And, um, you know, it just, it seems like, I don't know, maybe we could study something cool. And we, we just kind of chatted. We chatted for like an hour or so. And across the course of the hour, um, we actually realized that um, this, it might be really interesting to study this thing over in China and how people in America perceived it. And so we, over the weekend, um, was it over the weekend? Yeah, over the weekend, we drew up a pre-proposal for the National Science Foundation. And I sent it off to a, to a program officer I knew. And I said, look, there's this interesting thing happening. We think it would be cool to look at how Americans are responding to it, even though it's not here. Uh, and they said, sure. And so we went ahead and wrote the grant proposal. Um, so within a couple of days, we sent it into him. He funded it overnight. Uh, and about a week later, we started, <laughs> we started in about mid-February, we started um, uh, talking to Americans over, over the internet. We started surveying Americans about the pandemic. And we followed them from about February 15th to March 15th when the world shut down to about a year later. And so the project became something very different than what we thought. Um, but we, had, we were able to collect some very early data and then watch over time what, what ended up happening. So one of the things that's notable, I think, about uh, science communication over the course of the pandemic is that there's been a lot of debate about the effectiveness of the communication about science over the, you know, there's this CDC has been criticized. Um, tell us, what, given what you've learned, what you study, what's the most effective way to communicate science in way so that it will persuade the public to what scientists have to say? So it will sway the public to what scientists have to so say? So that they'll yeah. listen to what scientists have yep. to say. Yeah, so this is the big problem um, and it, the, or, or the, the big opportunity, I, whichever way you wanna put it. Um, so the things that you wanna think about is you wanna have messages come from trusted sources. In our country, turns out that's an issue. <laughs> because we have a very politically polarized environment. And so if you have the same message coming from a trusted source and a not trusted source, people are gonna respond very differently. And so we'll have somebody um, you know, like Anthony Fauci, who's um, talking to people like me, and I inherently trust Anthony Fauci. One of the things that I always did throughout the pandemic was, okay, well, what's he doing? <laughs> and I'm gonna do what he's doing. But then you get a whole swath of the American public who 
believe the opposite. They don't trust him. And so whatever he says, they may actually want to do the exact opposite. So that's one of the first things. It has to come from a trusted messenger. What that means is that Anthony Fauci is going to work for me, but President Trump, uh, former President Trump is going to work for other people, presumably. It doesn't work all the time anyway, but that's the idea. So trusted sources are very important. Um, Helping people understand social norms, and by that what I mean is what everybody's doing, or at least what everybody thinks you should be doing. You, you, there's sort of two different sides to social norms. It's, it's, it's descriptive, what everybody's doing, and it's what's called injunctive, meaning um, what people think you should be doing. Uh, and both of those are important, and you, you can use information about social norms or where social norms are headed towards. Um, to get people to be more likely to essentially jump on the bandwagon. Um, so if you tell people, you know, most people, 70% of people are wearing masks, a non-mask wearer is going to be more likely to wear that mask. They have to believe that the 70% applies to them, though, because they might think it applies to, well, 70% of that other group, but not my group. Um, it, has to be, it has to be applicable to their group. And again, in our politically polarized society, it, it may, it's, it's, been making and continues to make communication much harder. Um, there are other techniques you can use. You can use um, emotional information. You can, um, and, and that can be done in a variety of ways. You can use fear tactics if you want to. Although if you use a fear tactic, you have to help people understand, okay, now I'm afraid, now I perceive risk, but what do I do about it? They have to have that, that, that other part with it. It's called self-efficacy. They have to feel like um, that there is a solution and, and they can make it happen. But you can do other things too. There have been some very nice messages around um, empathy, just helping people understand that uh, this affects not just you, but it's affecting these other people. And this, this person, and you can tell a story about that person, this person um, ended up um, you know, either having a horrid trip to the hospital or even perhaps perished. Um, and th that, those kind of emotional manipulations can help. Again, our politically polarized society is getting in the way because if you're on the other side of the political spectrum, some, especially with fear tactics, reactants can be produced. So people can get angry about the, the messages. They can outright just reject the messages because they think they're being manipulated. Um, so again, political polarization makes a difference here. Um, a lot of what I study is how do you use use and present statistics to drive risk perceptions um, and to motivate behaviors. Um, and there's, um, that topic's a bit more complicated, but there's a variety of different things you can do to lessen the cognitive burden on people so they can at least understand what the numbers are, and then ways that you can present the information in order to motivate behaviors more. So you've, read, you've mentioned statistics, and it's clear that that is one of your areas of expertise. Your book is Enumeracy in the Wild, Misunderstanding and Misusing Numbers. Let's talk a little bit about that book and that work. First of all, for those of us who are not particularly numerate, what is enumeracy? Yeah, so in, you can think about enumeracy as like literacy, but with numbers. Um, it, you know, it's, 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 you know, technically it's the ability to understand and use probabilistic and mathematical concepts. I normally say it's about math ability. Um, we can get more technical. We can think about like really what aspects of math ability seem to matter to everyday life. Um, because I would also add that at least when I study numeracy, I'm interested in I'm interested in the abilities that people have and don't have that matter to everyday decisions that we make. So I'm not looking at complex math. I'm not looking at I'm not looking at calculus or geometry or well, I guess geometry is more everyday sometimes, but I actually don't look at geometry. I, I'm looking at things more like arithmetic and algebra and even relatively simple things with it within those domains. So is numeracy an innate skill or can it be improved and developed? It's a little bit of both. So there is, there is some, um, so, so first of all, we are all born, born as mathematicians. We are born with the ability um, to detect uh, uh, differences in numbers of, of things. Um, even like very small children and even infants can detect differences in quantities. They can even perform simple arithmetic. So if you have even a very, very, like if you have even an infant and you show, uh, you show the child um, like one doll and then you put it behind a screen, 
And then ta-da, you open up the screen and there are two dolls. They're very surprised. They know that there was just one before and now suddenly there's something very different. So in a sense, they, they, can, they can count. They're not counting exactly, but they can count. And the same thing is true of other species too, ranging from dogs to beluga whales to you know, all, all, kind of, all kinds of critters. And so now I've lost track of your question. Well, it's but it's it's also true, is it not, that numeracy can be learned as well, right? I mean, you you say yes. we're born with these abilities. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So, it's you know it's math class. It's the math classes that we all went to that really started back in preschool or kindergarten, and that people followed through high school and oftentimes into college. Um, so taking it, in taking a math class, you can improve your numeric abilities. Uh, you can also just practice on your own if you want, um, but improving math ability does take some practice. Um, you, don't, you don't have to, and this is sort of going back to what I said before, if you want to improve your math ability in a way that helps everyday decision making, you don't have to practice with really difficult math. You have to practice with simple things like adding and subtracting numbers, uh, like fractions and probabilities. And you can't just see a problem and see the answer. That's not going to help at all. That's actually going to make you overconfident. You have to see the problem, guess what the answer is, try to answer the question, and then see, and then get feedback on whether you're correct or incorrect. That's the way that that's the way that you learn. There's also some other things that can be done, some of which, um, some of which we've been able, some of which we've tested in the lab. Um, you, you can do things like remind yourself of. Like before you go in to do your practice, and this is because a lot of people tend to be kind of afraid of math. There's a lot of math anxiety out there, a lot of just discomfort with numbers. One of the things that we have found, and I have a feeling you're one of those, one of the things that, that we found um, in experimental studies is that if you have people think about, and it just spend a few minutes writing about what's of value to you. Like our family and friends, of, like think about this, Paul, our family and friends of value to you. Of and you course. think about that for a minute and if, uh, yes, and of course they are. And then I say, okay, will you just spend just five minutes and, and tell me and just write down what it is about family and friends that's important to you and how does it make you feel good? What that does is it, um, it kind of makes you take a step back in a sense. Um, and if you then practice math again after that, there's this really interesting effect that happens where you're a little less afraid because you focused on something bigger and broader than this dumb math questions that are right in front of you. And instead you kind of take this step back, you kind of take a deep breath of, yeah, this stuff is so much more important, but let me spend a minute on this at least first. And you practice those math problems and it's actually a little bit easier and you get a little bit better um, faster. So, so you've, if, sorry, you've no, told please. us how to build our numeracy. Um, what are some of the benefits of being numerate? Oh gosh, okay, so that's what I've spent most of my time studying. Um, so we started off studying numeracy as, uh, I, to be honest, I started off studying it because I first saw it at a, a measure of it at the, at the National Cancer Institute. I was working for them part-time and here for, from here from Eugene, Oregon. And they were using this interesting numeracy test to say things about how women who, um, uh, who are going in for a, ma for a mammogram, they don't necessarily understand the risks and benefits. And oh, look, people who are better at, at numeracy, they actually understand more. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But as I thought about it more, I saw a talk or two on it while I was there. And as I thought about it more, I was like, but wait a minute, we use numbers everywhere. And it's not just about understanding what the numbers are. It's not just about spitting back numbers, you know, spitting back numbers that you see in front of you. It's about using them. It's about taking them in and decision-making and integrating them with other information or not. And I thought there's something really cool here. And we just started playing with it. And, uh, and this is some of the work that I did with Paul Slovic, by the way, going back to your question from earlier. So part of what we looked at um, is the general notion that's known in my field that how you present information often matters as much as what you present. And so there are things like framing effects. If you are going into the doctor um, and, uh, he, uh, and she wants you to get some medical treatment. She can tell, and let's say it's a, it's a very serious situation and there's, there's the potential for mortality versus survival involved. If, in those kind of cases, she can tell you, um, you know, you have a 90% chance of surviving if you, if you do this treatment. 
Or she can make a different choice. She can tell you the same information, but she can frame it in a different way. Instead of saying you have a 90% chance of survival, she can say you have a 10% chance of dying if you take this treatment. Which one feels better? Which one feels worse? They are the exact same option. It's the same information. It's logically equivalent, but people feel much better about that treatment if you present it in terms of the 10% survival than if you present it in terms of the 90% uh, mortality. But, and here's the but, and this is one of the first things we studied, it depends on how good or bad you are with math. It turns out that people who are good at math, they hear the 90% survival, they more or less automatically transform it into the 10% mortality. It makes no difference how you show them the numbers. It's people who are less numerate, where what we think happens is that they hear 90% survival, and the 90% goes wah, wah, wah. And the survival is like, yeah, oh, good, that's a good thing. Or in the mortality case, it's a bad thing. But in both cases, the number is just sort of like there and not making any sense. And so they're the ones who are actually very influenced by how numbers are presented. Um, and it makes a big difference. And so we've studied, I've studied, we've studied, I have a whole bunch of colleagues that I work, uh, work on with these issues. We've looked at all different kinds, a whole bunch of different kinds of just decision-making phenomena, ways that people understand and use and don't use um, numbers and stories and frames of information um, differently depending upon their math ability. And it turns out the sort of overall story, and this is part of what I write about in my book, is that people who are highly numerate, um, it's not just that they understand numbers better, they, they do understand numbers better, but they have a whole assortment of different habits with numbers that they bring to bear, not just on math tests, but in everyday life. So that they do things like reframe a situation like we were talking about a, a minute ago, uh, or they focus on the numbers more so that an anecdote or a story doesn't matter to them as much. They'll still listen to it, they'll still be affected by it, but they'll integrate it with numeric information so that they use more and more complex information when they're making choices. So we've looked at all kinds of decision-making kinds of things. Um, we've also looked at, um, at life outcomes. Uh, we've looked at how well do people do in their finances, for example, or their, their income, or their, uh, their health status, different choices they might make about their health. So we've looked across a whole variety of different theoretical and applied issues, trying to get a handle on what happens when people just differ in math um, beyond simple comprehension of numbers. That's, uh, the work is so fascinating. So Ellen, we're coming to the end of our time. This will be my last question. Um, sure. In addition to all the other things that you've spoken about, all the other things that you do, you are also a teacher. I am a teacher. So tell us about one of the classes that you teach. Yeah, so I just had a fantastic graduate course um, that had a really, uh, just a ton of fun teaching. Uh, it was called, it, so it was a graduate seminar. So it was, it was primarily discussion-based. Uh, it was called uh, Science Communication and Decision-Making. And we talked about a lot of the stuff um, in longer form <laughs> that you and I just talked about now, Paul. So we talked a bit about how emotions influence decisions. We talked a lot about how numbers and numeracy or, or math ability affect decisions. Um, and it was a particularly interesting class. And I was a little bit afraid of it going in, I must admit, because it was a combination of very different students. So I had first year graduate students from the School of Journalism and Communication who had had next to no statistics or in methodology training in the kinds of things that I do, up to fifth year psychology graduate students who had just tons of methodolo methodological and statistics training. And I was terrified of how the heck am I gonna get these students to come together, have interesting discussions and learn from one another. And I have to say they were fantastic. It was a really fun class to teach. One of my favorite ever actually. Fantastic. Well, uh, Ellen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today about your really fascinating work and the work of uh, the uh, Center for Science Communication at the School of Journalism at the University of Oregon. It's been a real pleasure. It was absolutely my pleasure, Paul. I look forward to seeing you again. I've been speaking with Ellen Peters, Philip H. Knight Chair and Director of the Center for Science Communication and Research in the School of Journalism and Communication at the University of Oregon. She is also the Director of the Cognitive and Effective Influences in Decision-Making Lab. Thanks so much for watching.